how bad do you really want to change? I'm not talking about a, a habit here and there. I mean, really, really change. See, I, I've, been, I've been pastoring for a little over 32 years. And here's what I've learned about people, and I'm sure you will agree because you've known people like this too. I've known people that have given their life to Jesus. They have been baptized. And they're good people. But their character never really changes. They were lazy when they gave their life to Jesus and couldn't hold down a job. 20 years later, they're on their way to heaven, but they're still lazy and can't hold down a job. I've known people that were manipulators when they gave their life to Jesus. 20 years later, they're a saved manipulator 20 years later. I've known people that are bad with money when they gave their life to Jesus. And it doesn't matter how much money they make, they stay broke. Not because of income, because of spending. Their character never changes. You guys follow me here. See, you can give your life to Jesus and make some progress, but never truly change. I've known people that had a hard time being committed in a relationship. They give their life to Jesus. They get baptized. 10 years later, they just cycle through relationships. They never change. Today I want to talk about what God initiates in our life that brings about deep change in your life. See, it is possible, regardless of your age, to be transformed. It is possible to break a family cycle. It is possible through the power of Jesus Christ to really be changed. But you have to understand, I'm standing here right now in Grapevine, Texas. And I want to welcome all of our campuses and people joining online. Let's give them a hand, all right? All right. But I'm in Grapevine, Texas. And this is a real place and a real building with a real stage with real people, a real church. But there's a world that's out there that we can't see. It's a spiritual world. We don't, we don't really know what to do with the spiritual world. But let me tell you some things about it. The spiritual world is larger than the physical world. And the spiritual world is more powerful than the physical world. Everything that happens in the natural happens in the spiritual first. If you're going to change, you see, you can't solve supernatural problems with natural solutions. See, this is where books on just changing your habits changes your whole character. Wrong. You can change your habits and get up earlier and work out and still be a jerk. Are you following me? You can, because you can't solve. Your, see, in your character, it's not something a surgeon can see if they split you open. They can see your lungs. They can see your heart. They can see your aorta. They can see your liver. They, can see, they can't see your character. Your character doesn't show up on, a, on an MRI. But it directs your life. So you can't solve it in the natural. You have to solve it in the spiritual, which means there has to be a battle won in the spiritual world for your life to be changed in the natural world. Are you following me so far? Jacob is one of the big three in the Old Testament. You see it throughout the remainder of Scripture. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's one of the big three. 
But Jacob didn't start out that way. Jacob had an incredible calling upon his life, but he had really, really questionable character. See, he had a twin brother named Esau. And their dad, Isaac, you know, Jacob's the grandson of Abraham, the son of Isaac. And Isaac promised his inheritance, his resources to his son Esau because he was the oldest. Jacob didn't like it, so Jacob schemed and stole. His name Jacob actually means schemer, liar, trickster. That's what it means. He stole the inheritance from his brother. And he's been on the run for 20 years. And, he, and he's working for his sleazy uncle Laban. But in spite of all of that, Jacob is incredibly blessed. See, he's blessed, but he's not broken. And because he's not broken, he's still the same guy. But God blessed him. He built this humongous empire of wealth. But he's not broken. And life's not working. And God comes to him and says, listen, I want you now to leave this and it's time to go back home. And Jacob wants to go home, but he knows he has to deal with his brother to go home. But he packs up, he follows God, and they travel all of his enterprise. They travel and they come to the river Jabbok. And Jacob says, I'm gonna send up an envoy to just see what Esau's temperature is. So he sends them over there and they come back and say, listen, he's on his way with 400 men for you. Now Jacob's a smart man. He's a smart businessman. He diversifies. He takes his wives and kids, puts them over here, takes some of his possessions, puts them over here, takes others and puts them over here in another area. So if Esau comes, he gets one, he doesn't get all. He's got separate LLCs, if you know what I'm talking about. And Jacob goes off by himself. Wealthy, blessed, but unbroken. Let's pick up the story. Genesis 32, verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. See, God has to get us to where it's just us and God. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now watch this. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means the face of God. For he said, I've seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. There's a lot in this story. Let me, let me give you the, the, the Brad White uh, cliff note version, okay? The man is not a man, it's Jesus. How do we know it's Jesus? Two things. It, it's what's called a Christophany. It's an Old Testament appearance of Jesus, a pre-resurrection appearance of Jesus. Because Jacob says, I have seen God face to face. So he says, I've seen God. Then face to face, and he lived. No one in the Old Testament period could lay eyes on God and live. But when God came in human flesh, Jesus Christ, people could look on him and not die. They could truly look on him and give him their life and truly live. So we know it's Jesus. And Jesus starts a wrestling match with him. So the first thing out of this story, there's only three things I'm gonna give you, all right? So one out of three, number one is wrestling is God's idea. God's idea. God picks the fight with Jacob. Why? Because he wants to prove something to Jacob? No, he wants to do something for Jacob. 
Jacob is a man of physical strength. He's been marked by physical strength all of his life. When he and his twin brother were born, his brother Esau comes out first, the Bible says that Jacob grabs his heel and he's trying to pull Esau back in the womb so he can get out first. Yeah, you know that he and Esau fought so bad in their mother Rebekah's womb that God came to her and he said, just like they fought and have been divided in your womb, they'll be divided as grown men. Physical strength. But God picks the match because God wants to get Jacob to the end of Jacob. Until he can get Jacob to the end of Jacob, Jacob's character never really changes. See, God wrestles with us. See, wrestling is God's resistance to me. See, God doesn't just give me what I want when I ask it all the time. Most of the time, there is resistance to test me to how much do you really want to change? How much do you want these circumstances to change? How much do you want your life to change? Because if it was just ask and receive, ask and receive, ask and receive, you and I would never develop the resilience and the resolve that it takes to be somebody who is transformed and who sees others transformed. So God resisted. And I'm talking to people all over this room right now. You're in a wrestling match with God. And that's good. Wrestling with Jesus is as natural as breathing. It's not bad. Sometimes he wrestles with us because there are issues inside of us that he wants to transform. Sometimes he wrestles with us because there's issues in other people's life that he wants us to press in and pray for and ask God for. And we wrestle with God for them. Sometimes we press in and we wrestle with God for our kids. And I can go on and on. But wrestling is God's resistance. And when we talk about it, the language in the Hebrew here is not like a slap fight. Remember slap fights in school? No, it's not a slap fight. This is a knockdown, drag out, hand to the face, hitting each other on the ground, MMA, grappling, jujitsu, on the ground, brawl. This is a fight. This is a brawl between Jesus and Jacob. And by the way, you know this is a rigged fight, right? Jacob is no match for Jesus. It could be over in a moment. It's not about Jesus defeating Jacob. It's about Jacob defeating himself. And he wrestles with him. And it's a fight because inside of Jacob, he wants his circumstances to change. He wants this to be made right with his brother. He wants to go home. He wants to be blessed, but he's still got that old Jacob in him. So it's just all this pinned up anger and fight and I want it, but I really want to hang on. And I want it, but I really want to hang on. And it's just this wrestling match. And finally, God says, He's come to the end of himself. Now, the Bible says, it says when the man realized he wouldn't let go. That doesn't mean that the man couldn't make him let go. It means Jacob became an empty man. So wrestling is God's idea. Number two, wrestling leads to brokenness. See, there has to be brokenness for change to happen in the spiritual world that leads to the natural world. You and I cannot change until we're broken. A horse cannot be ridden until it's broken. You and I have to be broken to change. And so God wrestles with Jacob. Notice what happens. Jacob comes to the end of himself and God touches his hip comes out of a socket. Jacob still doesn't let go. I can tell you this. If he dislocated my hip, I'm out. Checkmate, done, game, set, match, over, I'm out. I don't want the pain. Not Jacob. He wants something to change so bad, he just hangs on and keeps fighting. And God said, what is your name? Now, why did 
He asked his name because he needed to know it. No, he already knew his name. He wanted Jacob to come clean. See, Jacob, when he said, my name is Jacob, he's like, hey, I'm a schemer. I'm a liar. I've swindled people. I've cheated. I have manipulated things to get my own way. That's who I am. See, brokenness compelled him to come clean. And see, brokenness, so wrestling is God's idea. Wrestling leads to brokenness, and brokenness leads to breakthrough. What happens now? What happens? Verse 27, look what it says. What is your name, the man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. He says, I'm gonna change your name. The name Israel means to strive with God, to wrestle with God. He says, you're gonna go from being a schemer to now you are somebody that have wrestled with me and won. You've learned how to get empty You've learned how to get a limp. You've learned what it takes to be transformed. And a transformed life will now be your name. His name is Israel. The descendants of Jacob are the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. God could not multiply his life until he changed his character. His name had to change before circumstances could change. He says, I'm gonna change your name. Two things Jacob did. He came clean and he held on. He came clean, say it with me. He came clean and he held on. Say it again. He came clean and he held on. What does it mean to come clean? That means today. This is where it begins. Hey, this is the truth about my life. This is me. I'm angry with God and I'm making decisions out of anger with God. This is me. Just get clean right now. I'm going to confess it. I'm going to get open. I'm going to get real. No more hiding. No more secrets. No more closets. No more holes in the backyard. Nothing else. No, no, no. No more. We're going to get clean. We're going to get open. We're going to get honest because honesty leads to brokenness and brokenness leads to breakthrough. It's a pattern in our life. It's the first step always to transformation. Marriage, parenting, job, finances, health, whatever. It's always, I get get honest, I'm overweight. I need to get, I need to lose some weight. I'm harming my health. No more looking in the mirror and and seeing Brad Pitt. (laughs) The reality is that's not the case. You got to get honest. You've been on this? Get honest. It's how breakthrough happens. It's how change, see, until Jacob could own it, Jacob couldn't change. And then he held on. This speaks to the tenacious continuing to come to Jesus in prayer. I don't know how to pray. Perfect. You know how to talk? You know how to talk to people? I talk to your kids, I talk to your parents, I talk to a friend, I talk, just talk to God. But if I say it wrong, you're not gonna say it wrong. And by the way, he's big enough and he understands enough to know you don't always know what to say and he understands what you're trying to say. He understands it. Just talk and keep talking 
and keep coming clean and keep talking and keep asking and keep asking for him to show you the truth of the situation. You just keep talking. You just keep coming. You just keep talking. You just keep coming. You just keep talking. You just keep coming. And you you get involved in your church and you get on a team and you serve at Hope Fire City and you get involved. You get around people. You're learning more truth. Learning truth about people. Learning truth about the Bible. Hearing Pastor Ed speak. I'm learning. I'm in a Bible study class. I'm learning. I'm learning the truth. I'm going to counseling. I'm dealing with things in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm facing it. I'm dealing with truth. I'm pursuing truth in every area of my life and I just keep coming 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 and what happens? The way you see yourself. See, everything, every decision I make is linked to my identity. My identity is how I see myself and how I believe God sees me. See, the more you get empty and the more you keep coming and the more you discover truth, you begin to learn who you really are in the eyes of God. And it changes the way I see myself and it changes how I make decisions and it changes how I see my spouse and it changes how I see my kids and it changes how I see money and it changes how I see people I work with and it changes how I see problems and it changes how I see pain and it changes all these things in my life. Because I get around people. I'm learning truth. I'm pursuing truth. I want to know what the truth is about me. I want to know what the truth is about our marriage. I want to know what the truth is about our finances. I want to know what the truth is about my health. I want to know the truth. I'm pursuing truth and I'm hanging on and I keep coming and I keep coming and I keep coming. And what happens is in that God marks your life. See, I'm talking to people in this room. Think about it. You're on your second marriage, and it's a good one. And one of the reasons it's good is because you walk with a limp from your first marriage. Because you didn't, you didn't handle yourself like you should in the first marriage. And you got your heart broke, and you had to get honest, and you had to come clean, and now you walk with a limp. See, your limp is your story. Your limp is the lessons that you've learned that God has taught you. I'm talking to some grandparents in this room. You're much better grandparents than you were parents. You did the best you could as a parent, but you didn't know how to be a parent. You didn't have good role models. You didn't know how. Maybe you didn't know Jesus then. Maybe you weren't at fellowship then. Maybe you didn't know. But you learned. And you got clean. And you held on. And you've kept coming. And you haven't quit. And now you can bond and go to another level with your grandkids that you weren't able to with your kids. But as your grandparent with a limp. Some of you have lost your business. You had it all. The car, the home, everything. And through a series of choices, you lost everything. And you got a limp. Now God's blessed you again, but you see money different. You see possessions different. Because you walk with a limp. Are you guys following me on this? See, I've been following Jesus for a little over 34 years. And I'll walk with a limp. Let me tell you some of the limps I walk with. I'll walk with a limp because I've learned there are problems that only God can solve. See, I used to think I could solve them. If I could talk big enough, if I could get loud enough, if I could work hard enough, I could solve the problem. But God had to teach me over and over again how to come to the end of Brad. And I've learned there's problems that only God can solve. Anybody else with me on that one? I've learned painfully there are doors that only God can open. You can't make it happen. You can't force it. There are doors that only God can open. I'm going to tell you something. I thank God for my limp. I thank God I've learned that there are problems 
too big for me, but not too big for him. I'm glad that I've learned and learning that there are doors that only he can open. And I can't. I've learned there is pain, real pain. It hurts so bad, you don't know if you'll ever see the sun shine again. But there's pain that only he can redeem it. If I don't let him have it, if I don't just let him mark me with it, I'll become embittered and angry and distant and cold and spew vomit on people the rest of my life. But if I can learn, there's pain that only he can redeem. It changes it. I've learned there are resources that only he can provide. Ledger sheets and QuickBooks only go so far. Sometimes you need something that QuickBooks can't understand. Sometimes you need something does you know anybody else that's ever seen it happen? Listen, let me tell you something. I serve a God that I've watched in my short life provide for me in ways that only God could provide. I remember when we, when we were pastoring in Tampa, we were just getting launched, and, and we, 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 paid, we did this mailer to the community. Cost like twenty four hundred dollars and twelve twenty four hundred twelve dollars and like fifty cents, something like that. Specific, and they let me do it. They were going to bill me for the bill. That's how long ago this was. Well, the bill came due. I didn't have the money. I didn't have two hundred forty two dollars, much less twenty four twelve. My mom and dad were in town. I was trying to be joyful with them in town. Um, you know how it is with family in town. I was trying to be joyful, and but I had I had I kept thinking about this bill so. I'm driving down Bristol Downs Boulevard. I go to the post office. I'll never forget this, man. I was 28 years old. I walk in this post office. I open it. There's one envelope in there. It's from some kind of trust. I don't even know what a trust is. I open it up. Wendell, it was a check for $2,400, $2,412, and 60 cents. And I got back out of my beat up Jeep Cherokee that leaked oil everywhere. And I thought, you're real. This stuff's real. I've learned there are resources only God can provide. And last, I've learned there are people that only God can change. You can't argue with them enough. You can't withhold from them enough. You can't barter with them. You can't love them enough to change them. Only God can change them. I remember when I met Joe Mira. Joe was from Brooklyn, New York. About my age, Italian, slick back hair, muscular. He was a bad dude. Very angry guy. Very bravado, very, you know, didn't believe in anything. He was, he was his own man and he was invited to our church by a coworker. I remember the Sunday that old Joe gave his life to Jesus. And he was one of those guys that when, when he got it, he got it. Within a matter of months, he had brought his entire family, uh, his closest and then his distant family. In our center section, there'd be two rows or three rows full of just his family that he had brought on Sunday morning. Life was changed. But he still battled this anger. He came out in his marriage and he had this I mean, this venomous anger towards his father, Joe Sr., who lived in New York. They had a very, they had a terrible father-son relationship. But as, but old Joe, he was an honest guy. And he joined our men's group. And he started coming, he started getting honest. And he started learning. Started pursuing the truth. And he came to an he goes, it's crazy for me to say this. But God's given me a love for my dad. I don't want to hang out with him. But I want to see Jesus change his life. 
So if he and Joe and the other guys in the church, we begin to press in and pray with Joe for his daddy to be transformed. Well, his dad comes down to visit during COVID because New York was just a little crazier than Florida. So they came down. When his dad's in town for COVID, Joe Sr. gave his life to Jesus. One of the last things I did before I moved to Dallas was I stood in a swimming pool in Joe's backyard because it was, it was self still wasn't open. I stood in the swimming pool in Joe's backyard and Joe was on one side, his dad in the middle and me on the other side and we baptized his dad together. Why? Because I've learned there are people that only God can change. Is there a conflict today you're praying to see resolved? Or is there a circumstance you're, you really want to see changed? Is there a character issue deep in you you want to see something happen? Let's come clean and let's hang on. I love this verse, Hebrews eleven twenty one. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this great church, Fellowship Church, for our pastors, Ed and Lisa Young. God, thank you for the thousands upon thousands of people that are gonna get to experience the love of Jesus in our parking lots at all of our campuses today. Thank you for that. With heads bowed, nice closed. Do you want peace in your life? Do you want to be made right with God on the inside? See, for some of you, the, the transformation that has to happen first is for you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, to give your life to Him. I'm not talking about going to church or being baptized. I'm talking about what the Bible calls being born again, where you surrender your life today to Jesus, and I wanna help you do that. If you say, Brad, I wanna take that step and give my life to Christ, then I'm gonna invite you to pray with me, something just like this in the privacy of your heart right now with me. Just say, dear Jesus, I, I admit that I'm a sinner, I'm coming clean. I admit that I cannot earn your forgiveness, I can't do it. But by faith, I believe that you died on a cross to pay for my sins and that you rose again as evidence they've been forgiven. And today I am turning from the direction my life is going. I'm repenting and I'm turning to you, Jesus. And I'm choosing from this day forward to follow you as my King, as my Lord. Where you lead me, I will go. I ask you to come live in me and save me and transform me from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you prayed that with me today, I'm so proud of you all over this room. If that was you, if you prayed that with me just now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm just the one looking out here. Just put your hand up in the air. Brad, I prayed that with you all over. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, all over this room. Father, thank you for these and for the lives you've changed. You're awesome. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching the Ed Young YouTube channel. That's right, and if you wanna be inspired, encouraged, and challenged like never before, subscribe and click the notification button. We believe this channel can help change your life. 